The title of today's message is Walking the Knife's Edge. Walking the Knife's Edge. I don't know how many of you know uh, what this is. If you know what it is, raise your hand. Do you know what a slacker is? How many knows what a slacker is? That, that's good. There were only about two in Sherman who knew what a slacker was. And I'm not talking about, uh, what's the, oh, I always freak the movie, uh, Back to the Future, where the principal says, Bueller, you're a slacker, you're a slacker. I'm not, I don't mean that kind of a thing. What, a, what an actual slacker is. We, we had uh, at camp several years ago, I think at Camp Carter it was like three years ago, they put up a slacker. And a slacker, it, the best way I guess to describe it would be, I, I should have put it up on, on a video, but... Uh, but it's like those straps that you'll see on tractor trailers of 18-wheelers when they need to strap something down. So it's about, you know, two and a half, three inches wide and flat. But it, it doesn't stretch too much, but, it's, but it's, it's narrow, and it has some give in it as you tie it, uh, tie it off on both ends. So uh, they had put up a slacker there just outside of the dining hall in, there in the, uh, at Camp Carter. And they, you know, tie it uh, to one tree and, and then another tree. So you've got this line that's kind of almost like a, you know, a person you know, walking uh, on, on the line across, uh, uh, you know, two buildings. It's that kind of thing, but it's only about this far off the ground. So we were watching uh, that year. We were watching a bunch of people try to walk on this slacker. And I was thinking, this can't be that difficult. Uh, but, and, and then I watched this lady from Europe who was there at camp that year, this lady, it was actually a teen, but she got on there and just started walking on that, on the slacker, just walked with, with uh, nothing to hold on to, and she'd go on one foot and bend down and stand up, and I thought, well, this can't be that difficult. Uh, so I got, up on the, I got up on the slacker, and I was gripping onto the tree because, after all, I was 18 inches off the ground, and I didn't want to fall. So, I, you know, you finally start to, 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 to let go of that and just see if I could just stand on it. And I thought, I've got this, but then, my, then it started wobbling and sliding more and more and more, and then I just flopped off, which is what most everybody else did. Uh, some, some were more successful than others. But, but remember what I'm talking about with that slacker. As we go out from another year of understanding God's plan of salvation, as we did, and as it was laid out so beauti beautifully at all the different feast sites that we attended, and we're going to talk about that as God's people here in the next weeks and months as we reflect upon that, as, it, as, as we reflected on it with, with what Mr. Greider had to say. But as we go out from that, how do we walk the knife's edge? The knife's edge. There are mountain ranges, and you've, you've probably seen these pictures where, where mountains come up to these ridge lines, and it's, they come up to almost to a single point, and then there's a ridge line that, that people actually hike on those things, those, and they call that a lot of times the knife's edge. You'll also see pictures, you know, is it's an idiom of how do we walk on the knife's edge of where they will have a knife, and, and figuratively this man is trying to stand on the, the point the pointed, uh, the sharp side of the knife. How do we as God's people walk the knife's edge? We are flesh and blood. We are in the flesh. We have human nature. We, Paul recognized that in Romans 7. I, what I don't want to do, I do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. This battle that we face of, of how do we walk that fine line? How do we stay on that narrow path? We... We learned, again, as we do every year, what this is all about, what the purpose is, why we are here uh, for all of mankind, uh, and what it means for all of mankind for us to be able to be there and serve in that capacity. But we've got to walk this knife's edge, because on this fine, narrow line that we walk, uh, there are chasms on either side, major chasms. And, and we, could, we could look at all kinds of different chasms. The one chasm is, look at me, I'm great, I'm, I've, I've got great wisdom and knowledge, and, I, and I've, I've got it going on, I'm, I'm super intelligent, and I, and I can do all this on my own, is the chasm that we fall off on the one side. The chasm on the other side is, I'm depressed, I'm hopeless, look at me, I'm a failure in my life, what can I ever do? Uh, yes, I'm in the church, but how can I ever do anything because I'm just a, a drip? You know, I really don't have anything to really offer. Those are both chasms. The knife's edge is I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Uh, 
with, with God's help, I can accomplish what God wants me to do for his purposes. That's the knife's edge that we have to walk, and we've got to go forward. Uh, so I'm worthless. Look at me. Vanity, pride, self-exaltation, all that. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's the knife's edge. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will guide and direct your paths. He will, he will help us get where we need to go. Or I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to fall off that chasm. I, I'm going to choose for myself what I want to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I, I know I read this and this and that, but I don't really want to do this. That's, that's the chasm. The other chasm, uh, what can I do? I, I'm so useless as a person. Uh, I, I, I have nothing to offer, this or that. Or I, I am so afraid of making a mistake that I stagnate. I run away from things instead of take things on as I should. My fear of failure, my... My, my, my all the different fears that I have cause me to stagnate, do the wrong thing, or, or uh, just simply not carry through with what I should do. All of those are chasms that we can fall into. We're coming back to walk that knife's edge, uh, and Mr. Greider spoke to, to that to some degree. Let's, let's go to 2 Timothy 1 today to begin. 2 Timothy 1 speaks to our calling, it speaks to our mission, it, it speaks to what God is doing uh, with us and through us and what he wants to do for us. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, the, the passage that we know well about what God's Spirit is, is designed to do for us, what God does through his Spirit. It is a gift that God gives us. And he says, he reminds Timothy of this gift of, of God that, that he's been given to stir it up. Uh, through the laying on of uh, Paul's hands in, in his receiving uh, that spirit. We know this well, verse 7, 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one, it's of power, it's of love, and it's of a sound mind. So he says in verse 8, Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Uh, going back into the world as we do, the challenges that we face, we see a time pictured where there will eventually be very little suffering uh, and, and, and happiness and peace and blessing. Uh, we are in this world now where there is much suffering, and we as God's people are going to suffer. Many are suffering now through loss uh, of, of a variety of things or through loss of people. But Part of our, our living this life is suffering for the gospel's sake. We suffer and go through what we go through because of what we see is in store for us, and it's according to the power of God. God, verse 9, the one who has saved us and he's called us with a holy calling. We know what this calling is. We were reminded of the calling. Not according to our own works. It's not about me and what I've done and, and who I am and the kind of things that I can offer as a person. You know, that's, that's one of the chasms that is, is, is not on the, the knife's edge. It's, it's a falling off of that. Not, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Powerful statement there. God has, has called us. He has reached out to us, and, and he has done that with great forethought. Verse 10, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and he's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher to the Gentiles. For this reason, I suffer these things. It, it's okay. I, I understand that I'm, I'm to suffer these things, he's saying here. Nevertheless, I, I'm not ashamed about it, for I know whom I've believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words. Hold fast those things, what, what, the things that are sound, which you've heard from, the, from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit which dwells in us. So the knife's edge. The, we're, we're committed to do good works. It's a knife's edge because two chasms that lie on either side of the knife's edge are always in our minds. They're always coming in there, be it the vanity, the pride, or the I am useless, I am nothing, I can't do anything, I need to run away from this. Uh, we must kick out both of those immediately and walk down that narrow path, that, that narrow ridge, that knife's edge of life. 
What will it be like for all of mankind to be in the state when we will no longer have to fight that battle? Can you imagine what it would be like to not have to fight that battle, that battle that we have right now going in our minds day in and day out? The I'm useless and I'm, I'm something. To, to be able to walk that battle, confident, walk that line confidently, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. If my heart is right and God is working with me and I'm yielding to him and I'm drinking in of his ways, God will be with me and I can go forward. What will it be like when the entire world has that mindset? What will it be like when we are spirit beings and we have none of that coming in. None of that would have any impact on us because we are perfect. We are, we, are like, we are like God himself. We are in his family. What will that be like? I, I admit to you that it is almost impossible for me to grasp that because I'm always battling. The battle is always there. We, I don't know what that's like not to battle that, but we know that time is coming, and we, we, we strive to walk the knife's edge as a testament to our belief that that time is coming. When, as Mr. Greider said, you know, Satan and, and that influence is, is no longer there. Uh, all the things that we need to do to, to, to focus on that as we go forward. The human nature conflict is there. Are you, am I, are we committed to walking the knife's edge? Are we committed to doing that? Are we walking that knife's edge now? as we leave the fall holy day season. It is a narrow path, a very, very narrow path. I want to talk about uh, uh, something that I saw and look, I was just looking up a, a scripture on the internet and something popped up, uh, it was a good pop-up <laughs> that popped up uh, on, on the right of my screen and it was something from BibleStudyTools.com. I want to cover uh, this with you. It just simply said five destructive lies. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll check on this. It seemed to be a reputable source. And as I looked at those, I think they, are, they bring great weight on the subject today as we consider walking the knife's edge. Here they are, five of the most destructive lies, and we're going to cover them quickly. Let's turn first to Second uh, Chronicles 16, if you could turn over there. Second Chronicles 16, and we'll cover something here in just a second. Here, here they are, the first one. I am doing okay. I'm doing okay. You know, I may not have this going on as well as I should. I may not have this going on as well as I should, but you know what? I'm doing okay. That is a destructive lie uh, because there is not a, a focus, a razor-sharp focus on the direction that we need to take. The second big destructive lie. No one's ever going to find out. No one knows. No one knows what's going on. No one knows what I'm really thinking right now. No one knows the, the, the bad thoughts I have about this individual, the, the little bit of the resentment that I feel, or, or the situation where I feel hurt on this side, and as a result, I, I'm, I'm having a sympathy party uh, and, and getting in this mindset. No, no one will ever find out. Uh, 2 Chronicles 16.9, uh, and speaking to uh, Asa, H Hanani, in delivering God's message to Asa after Asa had, had set up a treaty with Syria, Syria, made this statement. And at that time, verse 7, chapter 16, 2 Chronicles, And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you've relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the, the eternal your God, Therefore, the army of the king of Assyria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the eternal in that case, Asa, he delivered them into your hand. And then he makes this statement. For the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. God shows himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you've done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you're going to have wars. Asa was angry about that. He shut him up in prison. And things didn't end too well for Asa. 
But, but this, this statement of, of who our God is, he sees everything. And we've got to always keep in mind the, the, one of the most destructive lies that we can tell ourselves is nobody sees what I'm doing. Nobody sees what I'm doing. It is, it is, it is because hypocrisy is what it is. It is one of the things that will keep us out of being a part of the family of God to where that's never where that's gone from us forever. Uh, to, to, to allow ourselves to get into that mindset of no one will ever find out is destructive spiritually. Third thing, no one will ever get hurt. A very destructive lie. Well, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not doing you know, what these people or this people. I'm doing what I'm doing or I'm thinking what I'm thinking or I'm saying what I'm saying. I'm, I'm doing this over here by myself. No one will ever get hurt. Our actions, our thoughts impact others. That is the nature of it. It, 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 it is for good and it is for bad. Uh, the fourth, that's just the way I am. One of the things that in, in situations of, of counseling over the years where conflicts uh, occur uh, between individuals, one of the things that really is a red flag is when a person says, well, hey, you know, this, this is the way that I am. Uh, you, should, you should be able to accept that. I, I, when, when this happens, this is what I'm going to do because this is the way I am. This is the way I'm wired. I'm going to respond in this way, so you need to deal with it. Uh, versus, no, maybe the way that I am is not godly. So maybe I should change that. It is a destructive lie to be okay with the way I am when the way I am is something that's not of God. And then the last one is, I'll get to it later. I'll I'll deal with that later. I haven't meditated for 15 years. You know, thinking of Mr. Grider's message. I'm a person who hasn't meditated for 15 years, but I'll get to it later. Uh, It doesn't work, does it? It's a destructive lie. It's it's a critical piece in our spiritual growth to take time to reflect, to meditate. Uh, Do we make time for that? Do we make time for that? Five destructive lies. Let's look at Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3 is one that we we heard read uh, this feast in in New Braunfels. I'm doing okay. No one's ever going to find out. No one will get hurt. That's just the way I am. I'll get to it tomorrow. Those aren't uh, walking the knife edges, uh, the knife's edge. Those are not walking the narrow path. Do any of those plague you, me? Hebrews 3, verse 13, speaking of, I'll get to it later. Hebrews 3, verse 13, but exhort one another daily, daily. the, The inference here or the understanding is here that we're connected as a body to where we can encourage one another daily. While it's called today lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. One of those areas of deceit is, I can get to this later. For if we become partakers of Christ, we we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it's said, today, today, if, if we'll hear his voice, don't harden our hearts as in the rebellion. I'll get to it today. I'll set up a plan today to do this at this time. What are some of those bad habits? What are those, some, what are those areas in your life, in my life, where we, we're, we're not walking the knife's edge, where we're not walking the narrow path? Is it self-reliance? Is it inconsistent prayer and study life? We talk about this often, and we're going to talk about it today. Uh, don't raise your hand, but how many of you are not praying regularly? How many of you are not studying the Bible daily? Are you okay with that? Do you consider, if you are in that state, do you consider, do you think that, that you are walking the knife's edge? Do you think that I am walking the knife's edge if I call myself a godly person and I do not pray to God daily? and I do not study God's word daily, and I say I'm godly? Am I deceiving myself? Am I I saying I'll I'll get something done tomorrow? One of the things that, uh, well, I'll I'll get to this in a little bit later, but, but, but think about that. How consistent is our prayer and our study life? Are we, are we happy with it? And, you know, obviously I think all of us could say we can improve, we can always improve upon that, and we're striving to do that. But if you're in that situation where you are not praying, 
or you are not studying daily, I, I'm just telling you, brethren, you're not walking, we're not walking the knife edge. We're not walking the, na- the narrow path because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ strengthens us through our contact with God. We've got to stay in contact with God in order to, to, to be strengthened by Christ and also to, to feel, if we want to get on an emotive level, to feel that we're being strengthened by Christ and, and guided by, by Christ if we are continually keeping our nose in God's word. What about fasting? Uh, we fasted on the Day of Atonement. This is a true confessions by Burnett. I did fast on the Day of Atonement. But here's the true confession. Uh, as I was reflecting back when the last time that I had fasted, it was sometime in February or March. And I'm disgusted by that. And I, I remember after the feast last year, uh, stating in my mind, I wanted to fast on a regular basis. And, I, and my thought was, I, I want to try to do that every month or so. And that was my mistake. <laughs> Every month or so. So I, I think I fasted in, in November and December, and then nothing in January. Then I think I fasted again in February. And then things got going, you know. Mr. Greider talked about busy, our busy lives. Uh, meditation, taking time to think deeply, and, and taking time to, uh, to, to fast. It, it, it takes chunks of time. It takes a prioritization of time. So, you know, in, in thinking about this and in going through the uh, uh, Day of Atonement and reflecting on all of that again, I, I had to come to, to look at Burnett and say, how, how serious are you about this way of life? How serious are you about the tools that God gives us? So, as a result, you know, I realized I, I've got to set up a schedule to fast. And, and I would submit that there are probably... a a great number of individuals here who fast regularly, who have a plan, be it once a month or or, uh, once every two months or or whatever. And I'm not trying to be a Pharisee. Well, I fast two days a week. I'm not trying to do that. But to to say this is important enough in my relationship with God and in my ability to, to walk the narrow path that I must fast, that I as a Christian, that we as Christians must fast. We must do that. So uh, if if you're struggling with that, it, do you consider that a bad habit? Or, number one, what was that first one? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Euphemisms. Uh, oh, my G-O-S-H. J-E-E-Z. Uh, all the different ones. Uh, oh, my G-O-D. Whatever uh, those, those phrases are, and that's not a euphemism, but taking God's name in vain. Does that something that, with which we struggle? Wasting our time in unproductive activities. Lying, lying, in, in being absolutely truthful in every situation. Uh, folks from different cultures have talked to me and said, well, in our culture, it is really, really acceptable. Everybody kind of lies. I mean, it's just kind of understood that, that everybody lies. So as a Christian, it is a real battle uh, for that individual from that culture to strive not to have those little lies that don't really say it the way it is. Uh, do we say, you know, that's okay. I, I'm okay. Or do we say, that is not walking the straight and narrow. That's not walking the knife's edge. I've got to walk it. Unproductive uh, communication styles uh, and, and cycles that we fall into with our spouse, with our loved ones. Uh, communication that, that doesn't get us anywhere, that ends up in, in arguments and battles. Of, of, of not changing our, our style of communication and our way that we communicate with one another to be one of that's honor and respectful and, and works through the challenges that we face. Overeating, overdrinking. Uh, when was the last time that... Uh, that we overdrank. Did any of us overdrink this past feast as we worshiped God and, and celebrated the wonderful world tomorrow? Were there any days where we may have over, overdrunk? Is that how you say that? Over, overdrank. May have overdrunk. Overdrunk. Is that, is that a situation that, that we could have experienced? Is that okay? If it is, is that, a, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Drank a bit much that got a little loose-lipped, and uh, people kind of like trying to ease me over this way. But, but you know, I'm okay. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here at Sabbath. It's all good. Uh, so, w- what are some of those things? Watching inappropriate material, a tendency to judge others harshly, maybe being a bit snarky, 
not esteeming others higher than ourselves, a tendency to become easily offended. Do we, do we get offended easily? A lack of patience with others. Always feeling put down in life by others or feeling like we're here when others are here, so we, we look for opportunities, if not voicing it, but in our own minds to see ourselves a little bit above this person here. Or even though I see this person is here, I've got this going on, so I'm really up here. Those kinds of things that we can allow uh, to take over our, our minds. Fault finding, judging motives, being paralyzed by fears, putting off decisions that need to be made, anger issues. Whatever the area of our life, do we recognize that these areas are deadly? that they are deadly spiritually, and they're causing me, even though I don't see it, they're causing me to fall off the knife's edge, the narrow path that I must walk. How can we use this feast as a springboard to launch us in the direction, uh, the continued direction that, that we're striving for, brethren, all of us are striving for, it. but how can we as, use it as, as, a, as a launch pad for us to continue to to develop good habits, productive thoughts, right actions, godly behavior. You know, it's often very, very difficult. The, the, the biggest difficulty with that, I, I find, is to just simply get started and to maintain in the early stages. It's, it's, like, it's like the slacker. When you get on that slacker, the first time you get on it, again, it's, you're trying to stay on it, and you're striving to walk down the slacker to the other side, but it's crazy, and it's, it's throwing you everywhere, and you're trying to get the balance. It's like the first time we ride a bike. We get on a bike, and it's all we can do to try to keep that balance going. It's very, very difficult at first. It's uh, actually similar to my uh, most recent fishing experience with Mr. Kylo. Uh, we went to a, a, a pond or a lake at an undisclosed location. I cannot share that with you. But, uh, but we were, uh, there were several of us that were fishing, and, and two individuals got this, this bigger, wider boat, and uh, Kylo was in the, in the back of this canoe and said, Hey, Andy, you want to jump in the canoe? And I thought, No. I remembered in, in a, or in, when I was 17, I remembered that experience. We, we, we actually, we didn't go through the camp. It was through a, a local church group, but we went into the boundary waters of Minnesota. And I had never really canoed. Uh, and, and here we were going to be 10 days in a canoe. And I remember getting in that canoe at the at first. I could not be in the back. Which is the back? The, ba the st bow, bow is the front, right? Bow, stern, stern, sorry. So the stern, I, I didn't want to get in the stern because I can't direct. So I just thought, well, I'll get up front. And then I just remember getting in that canoe. I thought, this thing is going to tip. If I breathe funny, I'm going to tip. And it really freaked me out. But, but, but like by day, day four, day five, I started feeling like, hey, this is, this is good. This is good. Well, it had been, you know, what, 17, 54, probably, uh, some 40, uh, almost 40 years since I'd really spent any time in a canoe. Uh, so I got in the canoe with Kylo, and, and here we are fishing and casting and hooking these monster bass, and, and I'm turned this way, and he's trying to bring this bass in from the back, and I realized I need to kind of help him get it in. So I shifted to try to just just a little shift to turn around and the canoes wobbling and you know Clyde's going whoa whoa and he was smiling the whole way but I thought this is going to be awful we're going to wipe out I'm going to ruin all of his tackle it's going to be gone I'm going to go down into the depths of this this very deep six foot pond or whatever and and, and not survive but it's very stressful uh, but it, it's very difficult when we first start whatever it is that new skill to 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 get going and, and get to feel, feeling comfortable because we're walking that knife's edge. We're so careful to try to, be, to try to do it correctly. Let's look at Proverbs 4. I want to talk about that today because that often is a huge hurdle for us as we start to, to really try to, to implement proper thoughts, proper behaviors, be it meditation, as Mr. Mr. Uh, Greider mentioned, whatever it is, it's, it's different ground, and it's wobbly ground. It's, it's unfamiliar territory, and it can be very, very challenging, but we've got to get started on those things where we, where we realize we're not walking that, that narrow path, where we're not walking that knife's edge. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, let's look at that passage. 
Proverbs 4, verse 25, he says here, Let your eyes look straight ahead, and let your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Know where we're going. Look, look to where we're going. And, and ponder the, the steps that we're taking, each step. It, it's, as, we, as we begin that walk, we've got to be very, very careful about each step that we take. It takes concentration. It takes bringing every thought into captivity. It takes an intensity of thought. And let all your ways be sta- established. It takes a focus to think about all of my ways. Are they established? Am, am I letting up here or there? But I've got to really, really think about that. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Remove it from that. We uh, stayed at this, this house through VRBO uh, down in New Braunfels, and Jeff was there, Lisa's parents, and, and Lisa and I. And this house, when you walked in the front door, it was, it was uh, sidewalk level. So it was a little tiny threshold, but then you're, you're right at the same level as the, as the driveway. But uh, if you turn left and walk for about 10 feet, you walk uh, right at the right as you go through the, uh, the, over, the uh, little doorway, you walk up into the, the kitchen. And it was a step of about that, that high, maybe what, four inches. And then if you turn right, you walk for a while. And then at the other end of the house, there was a little bathroom there. And you stepped up about the same amount to go into that. I cannot tell you how many times we walked into that step. I had groceries you know, hitting and banging my feet and knocking it all over. Jeff one time came out of the bathroom on the right side. Uh, we were in the other end of the house, and we just heard this crash, you know, everything falling. And I hear him going, kind of go, ooh. And, but anyway, Jeff was fine, but just, uh, but the, the, just a little, little step there. But we, it was difficult for us to really ponder the path of our feet in this new, lo- in this new location. After day three or day four, we handled the, the whopping four-inch step quite well, all of us, uh, on both sides of the house. Uh, it became more and more natural for us. Uh, look, look at Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And this gets back to the thinking deeply, uh, be it meditation, uh, reading God's word, dwelling on God's word, praying to God, uh, conversing with God, what we're thinking and, and, and what we're learning from him as we're reading his word and thinking on his ways. This, this speaks to that in, in how to stay on that path and how to walk the knife's edge. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, let's look in verse 6. Psalm 32, verse 6. For this cause... Everyone who is godly shall pray to you. So let me ask you this. Do you consider yourself godly? Do I consider myself godly? Am I praying to God? Do I pray to him regularly? Do I stay in contact with God? Uh, Again, uh, we can deceive ourselves. If we're not staying in contact to God, praying to you, praying to the Father, uh, then I submit that we need to take a look a new look at our godliness as, as far as whether we are godly. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. And they'll pray in a time when you may be found. And, and through the difficult waters that we face, surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You, God, are my hiding place. You're my hiding place. You're where I can go to be hidden and, and cared for. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. So how, how does God do that? How does God instruct us and teach us in the way that we should go? He, he does so as we hunger and thirst for his words, as we live godly lives and, and we are godly in that we are reading God's word daily to take in of, what, of how he wants to instruct us. Otherwise, he's not instructing us because we're not, we're not asking him to instruct us. We, we get no instruction from him if we don't read his word. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. God then guides us on that path. He guides us down that knife's edge uh, with his eye because we're drinking in of his way and we're seeing We're developing the mind of God to see what God would have us do. 
Don't be like, verse 9, the, the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. They have to be harnessed by bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. May we not be like that. Psalm 18. Psalm 18. This, this really kind of shows how that, that knife's edge walking, that path walking works, uh, and the way in which we can do that, and, and, and how... How it works at the beginning and then how it becomes sure ground and well established. Uh, remember I said at the beginning of, of when we start something new that we know is right, it's very difficult to develop that, that habit. But there's a principle at work here that is critical for us as we start building the right habit in the right kinds of areas of our lives. And this is demonstrated here in this passage. Psalm 18, Psalm 18, let's start in verse 20. Psalm 18, verse 20. And I'm in Job. Uh, Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Now, he's not on a vanity trip here. David's not. David is, is accurately looking at his life, and God helping him and guiding and directing him, and he's saying it as it is. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. I've, I've striven to follow him. I've, I've striven to be clean before God. He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Verse 24, therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, as we extend mercy to others, as we are, are gentle with others and working with them, as, and show that mercy while also walking in God's ways and not compromising with what is right. But with the merciful, God, you will show yourself merciful. And with a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. Verse 26, with the pure, you'll show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. For you will save the humble people, but bring down haughty looks. You will light my lamp. The Lord will enlighten the darkness that's around me, enlighten my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By, by my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. Who is, who is God? Who is he except the Lord? And who's a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength, and he makes my ways perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer, and he sets me on, on high places. He teaches me how to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze as we battle uh, Satan and his ways. He can strengthen us. You have given me also, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. And here's the point that I want to make with, with, this, with this whole thing of developing these kinds of, of, of habits that demonstrate walking the knife's edge. It is very difficult at first, and the wobbliness is there, be it a canoe, be it the slacker, be it trying to walk the knife's edge on a, on a, on a, on a mountain ridge. But, but notice what happens. This, this is a truism that happens in our spiritual walk. As we do that, verse 36, you enlarged my path under me so that my feet did not slip. Yes, we're walking the knife's edge in our lives. But God, as we do that, over time, he begins to enlarge that path for us so that we see it clearly. The world looks at that and they go, well, how do you do this? How do you? But God enlarges that path for us so we can walk down that and so our feet do not slip. And this brings me to the single key of, of the, today's message, to realize this, brethren. And if we remember nothing else, this is the critical piece. With anything new, with any new appropriate behavior or thought we're trying to emulate, with anything new, it seems like a knife's edge at first. Like we just slip one way or the other, we're off. But as one travels along this path, over time, the knife's edge morphs into a sure path, an enlarged path that, that where our feet do not slip and our feet walk on sure ground. And 
we know that to be true intuitively. We've seen areas of our lives where God has helped us overcome it, and we now no longer struggle with certain things. And we see how God has enlarged that path where it was so difficult at first, but over time God helps us to walk it in, and, it's, and it, it becomes a lot easier and a lot more natural, if I can use that term, with God's Spirit working with us to walk on that sure ground. It's that way with any behavior. Psalm 119. Let's go there. Mr. Bob Peoples, I don't know how many of you know him. He's a longtime minister. He's now retired, pastored for, for many years. He was there at the feast at New Braunfels this year, and he gave a, a sermonette that I, I just thought was very impactful. Uh, to do something like that in 10 minutes and, and hit it with the, the ability that he did, I thought it was very well done. But in, in uh, his message, he read this statement. It's a a scripture that most of us uh, know well, speaking to the, the commandments of God. It's in Psalm 119, and it's verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165. He says here, Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have those who love your law. There is a peace that settles in with those who love God's law. And it's not just a matter of, of the, the letter of the law, although we are to recognize the letter of the law and keep the letter, letter of the law, but to love the spiritual intent of the law, the, the, the way God's law impacts everything, his, his beautiful law, which is love towards God and love towards uh, neighbor. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Uh, literally, they have no stumbling block as a result of that. And he, he brought out this analogy. I love this analogy. Okay, so he said, he said you know, if you're, if you're driving down the freeway and the speed limit is 65, and you decide that you need to go a little faster than that, and you go, you go 70, or maybe 75, or maybe just a little bit faster, and then he said, and I'm not saying that I have never done that, and I'm not saying that I have done that. I'm just saying that. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, and I think many of us have been in that situation, but where you're pushing it beyond that, and you're pushing it significantly beyond that. He said, what's it like when you're driving, when you're driving that speed? You're looking around every corner, aren't you? You're looking over that hill. You're thinking, okay, up on the right, up, where's a good place for the police to hide? Where is the good, where are they? Oh, oh, I just went by one and I slowed down in time for him. But sometimes they work in twos. They work in twos, so they lure you into thinking, oh, yeah, you got by that one, and the next one's waiting right there. And you're looking around every corner. Are they going to get me? Are they going to get me? i got to slow down. i got to watch for this. And he said, you know what, though, if the speed limit is 65 and you set the cruise to 65, what happens? Ah, I can sit back. I'm driving. I'm at peace, unless I'm driving down 75 in Plano. But any, any place else, I, I'm at peace. I'm, I'm, I'm out, you know, between Sherman and McKinney. It's relaxing. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying. Nothing, nothing causes me to stumble. But, but when, when we do not focus our lives on everything that, that God's law touches, everything his way of love towards neighbor and love towards God, on, when we don't focus on all of that, we lose that sense of peace. We're always, we're, we're always looking. There's an, there's an edge that's there. There's a, a lack of peace versus walking within God's law. And when we are within God's law, there's peace. There's peace. There's comfort. And I drove the speed limit no faster up and back today. So that's another goal of mine that I'm going to continue to try to do so that I can have peace. But, but to, to, to understand that when we are within God's law, there is peace, there is safe ground. It is a, a, a truism of God. Let's go to James 2. James 2 speaks to the, the royal law. How are we doing at obeying the spiritual intent of the law? Is God first in our lives? Do we have no other, no other thing or no other person above God in our lives? What about our loved one? Does that person take precedence over God in our lives? If so, we're, we're not keeping the first commandment. If so, we cannot have great peace in that element. Do I have images, idols, things that, that I, 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 I worship, uh, whatever those may be? 
Do I take God's name in vain? Do I treat God lightly in certain situations? Do I, do I keep God's Sabbath day and, and rest on the Sabbath day? Do I, do I stay out of contact with all of my job situations that are going on? Do I focus on what, what the, that the Sabbath is a day of rest and fellowshipping with God's people and worshiping him? Do I honor my parents? Do I not commit commit murder? Do I not have murderous thoughts? Do I not have hatred? Am I, am I uh, adulterous in my mind in any way? Uh, stealing? Am I faithful in keeping my tithes? Did I keep my tithes faithfully this past year? Did I, did I prepare my offerings to give to God? Uh, am I stealing from him? Am I stealing from the government? Am I lying in any way? Am I bearing false witness about others? Am I coveting anything? Uh, when we look deeply into that, what, what what, how do we answer that? How, how can we look to God? Do we, are we blameless as David was with, with, uh, as he looked to God, as he strove to walk in those? Prover, uh, sorry, James 2, verse 8. James 2, verse 8. Jesus, uh, James 2, verse 8, here he's saying about, uh, yeah, the ro royal law. If you really, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you do well. But if you show partiality, you know, they had rich and poor that he was talking about earlier here. If you show partiality, well, then, then you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor, as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, well, don't commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you murder... You've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The law is a law of liberty. As, as we understand God's law written on our hearts through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is liberty. There is liberty in the Sabbath. We are liberated from Egypt, as Deuteronomy tells us. Deuteronomy 5. We, are, we recognize that we've been liberated from sin as we keep the Sabbath every, every, every Sabbath. We recognize that we get rest. We rest from our works, from the works of, of unrighteousness in God calling us to this precious truth and this way of life. That is, it represents a rest that we have from that by God's calling. Uh, the, the rest that we have each Sabbath. It is a law of liberty. It, we are liberated from the, the grips of Satan by, by being given this precious truth and this calling and the sacrifice of Christ. It, it, it is a law that helps us understand the great liberty and freedom that God wants for all of us to have, as opposed to being bound to Satan in his way. Uh, but he says here, for judgment is without mercy for the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Do we look into that? Do we, do we pray to God and ask God to hide us and ask God to instruct us? It is there to help us. The challenges come, though. The challenges come. And the challenges are for many of us here in this life, in this room right now. Let's look at, at what happens as we strive to walk the knife's edge and the challenges that we face and the commitment that we must have still through that. I think one of the, the most interesting places that I found in Scripture that speaks to this is in Job. We know what Job endured uh, in trying to figure out why is this happening to me? I have really tried to follow God fully and serve Him, yet why am I experiencing this? Have you felt this at times? Here's how Job felt. Notice, notice Job's commitment, though, regardless. Job 23, verse 8 you know, as he's talking about how his complaint is bitter, his, his hand is listless because of his groaning and all the things that, that he had gone through. Uh, how many of you went to uh, Orange Beach this feast? You remember Mr. Uh, Rhodes' sermon about uh, the boils uh, from head to toe? And he you know, was kind of basically saying uh, from head to toe, that, that's a lot of places for boils. Uh, and he had them all over. Job, Job really went through it, and that was just one of the things with which he was afflicted. But let's look here at Job 23, verse 8. Look, he's, Job is saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to walk this path. I, I'm striving to walk this path. I'm striving to, tr striving to walk this knife's edge of what is right and just. He says, look, I go forward, but he's not there. Where's God? Where is he? I, I'm going forward, and, and I go backward, and I cannot perceive him. When, when he works on the left, left hand, I can't behold him there. When he turns to the right hand, I can't see him. Where is God? 
But, but he knows the way that I take. He knows the direction that I'm going, uh, the, that I'm trying to go here. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way. Verse 11, I have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth even more than food. But, but God is unique. He's unique. And who can make him change? Whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me. And many such things are with him. Therefore, he says, I'm terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I'm afraid of him. For God made my heart weak. And the Almighty terrifies me. Because I was not caught, not cut off from the presence of darkness. Darkness is all around me. I'm in an awful state here. And because I'm not cut off from that, uh, from this presence of darkness, and because he did not hide deep darkness from my face, look at my situation. Where is God? Where, I'm, I'm committed to going forward. I'm committing to, to walking this way. But where is God? Why is God not here and here and here and helping me here and here? Uh, as we know, Job came to realize later as God answered him and began to, to share with him who he was and his greatness and his power and his might and, and his love uh, and, and just the, the whole concept that, that Job began to lose as the darkness crowded in around him that Job came to the point where he repented in dust and ashes because he saw himself for what he was in that respect and God blessed him. And, and he recognized this is this great God uh, who is there. But God does sometimes pull back. He pulls back sometimes to test us. Sometimes there is darkness around us, but we know that there is the path that we must follow. We must still walk that, that knife's edge even when the blessings aren't pouring in all around us, even when we're in uh, sometimes the depths of despair over, over a great loss. Christ himself said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 1 Peter 5 speaks to the answer to that, and it's something that as we walk the knife's edge, and as we love to walk the knife's edge, this, this narrow path, because it is the only path, the, the comfort that we're given, and, and that is, is listed here very clearly in, in 1 Peter 5 as, as he talks about Satan's desire to, to tear us apart like a lion would. Verse 9 1 Peter 5, 9, resist him, resist that, and stay steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Our, our brethren experience all kinds of sufferings. We all experience sufferings, and we recognize that. We share in the sufferings that we face, even when those sufferings may be different, but they are still suffering. <clears throat> but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, I see that path. I see where it's going. It's to eternal glory. May the God of all grace, uh, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. That is the nature. Job realized that uh, in time. After he has suffered a while, it was to perfect us, to establish us, to strengthen us, and to settle us. I want to be perfected, established, strengthened, and settled. I want God to do it mercifully to me. But I, I want that, and I know we all want that. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. A couple of final verses to look at today. Let's go first to Isaiah 43. We know the, the story of Hezekiah when God withdrew from him when the Babylonian envoys came. And uh, God withdrew from him for a while to test him. He wanted to test him. God does that sometimes. But he, we know that he has good for us in the end. He wants to establish us and strengthen us and settle us and perfect us. Isaiah 43 speaks about what God has done for us. It speaks about how he'll get us through the dangerous places and situations in life. And he speaks about the purpose for all of that. Isaiah 43, this is very millennial, but I think we can also look to this as not only as physical Israel will be reestablished, but how spiritual Israel, the Israel of God, uh, experiences this now through God. Uh, Isaiah 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, 1. 
But now, thus says the Eternal, who created you, O Jacob? Yes, God did create each of us, and he formed each of us. He formed you, O Israel. He formed each of us. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Recognize that God has redeemed us. I've called you by your name. You are mine, God says. Israel will recognize as as Jesus Christ returns and begins to bring Israel back, those those one-tenth or so that are alive, he will begin to teach them, you are mine, you are my people, and I'm going to use you as my people to spread out to teach all of the world because I love all of mankind, but I'm going to work through you. God's working through us, spiritual Israel now. and He's redeemed us even though we're nothing. He's redeemed us because we are his. When you pass through the waters, the the difficult waters, the raging waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. We must remember that as we walk the knife's edge, as we walk the narrow path. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were precious in my sight. You've been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I'm going to bring your descendants from the east, gather you from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Very millennial here. But again, metaphorically, for us now, as God brings us to him, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. God created us. This is the whole purpose for mankind's existence, for our existence, for your existence, for my existence. We are created for God's glory. God says, I've formed him. He's formed each of us. Yes, I have made him. Verse 21, this people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. This this, this is what God's done for us. Two passages to to finish. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. As we seek it, because God has called us, he's chosen to call each of us, as we then respond and we seek that path, look at what God does for us. Psalm 16, verse 11. He says here, David says this, you, speaking to God, you will show me the path of life. He will show it as as we seek it uh, because he's chosen to call us to that. We must respond. But you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is a window into eternity. At your right hand are delights forevermore. You know, I think of this, this statement here, you will show me the path of, 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 your, of life. We, we uh, of course, had the, the teen trip to Colorado this past uh, summer. And I was trying to remember the name of the mountain that we climbed the very first day. I think it was Mount McConnell. Where's, where's Mr. Vaughn? He was somewhere over here. Did I get that right? Mount McConnell. So Mount McConnell is, you know, we, we were here at the campground, and we see this, this path that really, it, it actually just goes right right there from the campsite just to start climbing the mountain. So we climbed, uh, different ones of us uh, went certain amounts and then came back down depending on uh, our degree of uh, climatization, if I said that right. But uh, we, we climbed up, and you, you know, kind of keep going around, and you're thinking, well, I'm just about at the top. But then you get around this other turn, you realize, oh, it's up there. Oh, oh it's up there. But anyway, we finally got to the top. And uh, there's a beautiful vista out across uh, the, I think it would have been the northern part of Colorado. But then as we started to come back down, there were some that, that decided to go back down the way that they had come. And, and it was going to be the shortcut. But then there was another area where we could turn off to the right, and it was the scenic route. Uh, So several of us decided to do that. There was a group ahead of us that did that, and then our group did that as well. And, you know, we kind of thought, well, this this is going to be neat. We've got time. It's going to be great. But uh, we we started going, and it started to go downhill at first, and then then it started to go uphill. And we're thinking, oh, wait a second, it's supposed to all be downhill 
uh, we're going back down the mountain, and then it just flat out got treacherous. I, it was treacherous. There, it, it, there were times when we were trying to find out, where is this path? Can, can we see it? And, and the terrain was getting more and more difficult. There were times when we would have to get directly on our buttocks and slide down to get through and kind of all fours and, and grab here and there. And we were thinking, this is a, a difficult path. Uh, and at first, I was thinking, oh, we're going to blow out an ankle, we're going to blow out a knee, somebody's going to slip and, and break his back or something trivial like that. I thought, are we going to make it down this mountain? Uh, every single step there for a while became a, a focused step of where am I going to step on which rock, and is that rock stable, and is this stable here, and what's the best way to, to navigate this? And it was, it was tricky. It was really tricky. And it was, in a sense, it was kind of like getting on that slacker at the beginning and feeling the wobbliness. But as we did it, and I'm sure the group ahead of us felt the same way, but as we went down that path, even though it was treacherous, we became more and more accustomed to walking on it, and the, the, the initial fear started to subside. And actually, it became an adventure. And, and I, I found myself starting to see the clear steps in, in the paths as we were to go, the best way to handle this. And instead of seeing everything as a, as a potential, oh, I'm going to die, I'm going to break my leg. Instead of that, I, I enjoyed the challenge that was there and, and, and actually had comfort in walking that path. It was like I began to see the path enlarged and the clarity with, with how I needed to attack that uh, that mountain it is interesting as that speaks to our life in our Christian walk. Finally, let's go to Psalm 37, because as I began to do that and I began to experience uh, the, the stable steps, the stable ground uh, that we could see more clearly, all of a sudden the beauty of, of the whole mountain area and the vistas that we saw began to open up all around me. And, and again, I, 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 I think that's a metaphor for, for our, our life. We see the beauty in God's creation. We see the beauty in what God is doing for us and wants to do for us for eternity as we walk that path and we take great joy in walking that path as it widens for us. Psalm 37, finally. Psalm 37, let's start in verse 23. So brethren, as, as we leave the feast and we move forward, Let's ask ourselves, what areas are there that I really need to shore up? What, which of those destructive lies tend to come into my mind? Which of those do I allow in? What am I really going to work on? What do I recognize as being, this, this, is, this is essential to my Christian walk that I do this. It is essential to my Christian walk that I change my way of thinking in this regard and get myself where I need to be, thinking like God and acting like Jesus Christ, and not play games. You know, I'm doing okay. Is, is, are we okay with that? May we not be okay with that. May we recognize that this God who is for us, that that will give us all we need to be a part of his family for eternity, is our main cheerleader and is our main supporter and our main encourager and the one who can give us what we need to do that, and he's ready to do it. May we, may we jump into that as we go forward here in the, in the months ahead, coming back to the spring holy day. Psalm 37, verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered, they're established by the Lord, and he, God, delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. David says here, you know what, I've been young, and now I'm old. And you know what I've seen? I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil, do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. He does not. The Lord does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever.